Okay, well, it looks like we have a smaller group today, but we'll go ahead and get started since it's a few minutes after. Welcome everyone. Um, this is the third and final session of Tech Transfer 101. And the purpose of this webinar is to provide program examples, challenges, and solutions for academic administrators at small and not yet established tech transfer offices. And our audience is academic uh, administrators at academic institutions in the Southeast Idea States. I'm Liz Knapp, and I'll be, I am the program manager for the Southeast Accelerator Network, um, and also on staff at the University of Kentucky Office of Technology Commercialization, and I will be the moderator today. Um, the session is being recorded, um, except with the exception of the autumn video, which we'll be playing. In our format today, we have a 29-minute clip to share with you, and then we'll have 12 minutes of presentations from our speakers, and then 13 minutes for open discussion. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand and ask them during the discussion. Um, so with that, I think you guys have all been introduced to our speakers, but for anybody new today, we have Allison Best. She is the Director of the Office of Technology Commercialization at the University of Mississippi, and she'll be presenting perspectives from a small tech transfer office. And we have Ian McClure, who's the Executive Director at the Office of Technology Commercialization at the University of Kentucky. He'll be presenting the perspective from a larger tech transfer office. And then David Gulley, the founding director of the tech transfer office of the Puerto Rico Science, Technology and Research Trust, which is a regional tech transfer office providing services to the island's public and private universities. So he'll present the perspective from providing services to multiple universities at once. And so the other thing I'd like to do is introduce our uh, little bit about our video today. So as a reminder, it's entitled Bridging the Gap Between Innovation and Technology Transfer, um, it's produced by Autumn. Um, in it, we will hear from four uh, directors of te technology transfer offices at Louisiana State University, Wichita State University, University of California, Irvine, and New Tech Ventures, which is a nonprofit affiliate of the University of Nebraska. And the host will be the Rocky Mountain Regional um, director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, in the video, the four directors will be answering the following questions. So they're going to address first and foremost, how do you get companies to engage with researchers and entrepreneurs? And that's going to really be the focus of our session today. They'll spend the majority of the time talking about that, fielding that question. And then do researchers view IP as something they have to do or something they want to do? And then the third question is, do you have a clearance process for faculty prior to publishing to avoid giving away IP rights? And that's an important one uh, to make sure you understand how that works. And then lastly, what are the royalty distributions for each university? And so we prepared a slide later on in the discussion to kind of give an overview of the, the different uh, approaches universities take for royalty distribution. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the video. Please let me know if you have any problems with the audio. Um, and then we'll join you back for the live discussion. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm just gonna take a second here to get us back on track with slides for the next part of our session. So just a few seconds. Okay, um, Allison, I think you, you're up first for your presentation. Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, again for your time today. One of the things we wanted to follow up um, after the video, especially again, my, remember my perspective is from a small or growing office, are um, some key points that were made in, in that particular um, segment from both a tactical and a strategic perspective. And so these slides, and, and you're gonna get copies of all of this, are just some really important things when you don't have a large um, dedicated office and resources to these that, that absolutely need to be put in place when, when you're starting to um, venture down the innovation path. Um, the first one is contractual and legal. Um, and you'll see from, from the bullet points there, uh, this is absolutely critical to your efforts, whether you be a, um, 
a one person office or another per no person office and other duties is assigned. This relationship with your general counsel um, and how contracts are currently managed at your organization is, is just absolutely critical. Everything from in terms of the culture of the contracts, what types of contracts the university is willing to engage in when all those industry things that the speakers were talking about to who's going to sign. Um, you don't want to get down the path with an external partner, be it a, a large BASF, like they mentioned, or a small entrepreneurial, and you don't know who can negotiate the contract and who can sign the contract. Um, another key element is when you're starting this path is thinking about who is going to rep represent you from an intellectual property perspective and from a commercialization and transactional perspective. Um, the University of Mississippi retains outside counsel for both of those efforts. Um, and it's really important that you know, again, I think we mentioned this on the last call in terms of how those count, how those count, how that counsel can be engaged legally with your organization culturally, how your general counsel feels about those engagements with outside counsel, um, and making sure that you've got a very clear expectation of how it's going to work with them. Um, very clear expectations on billing guidelines. Um, the, the key theme here is that when you're going down this path, um, especially on the IP side, again, you're, you're starting clocks that you cannot stop um, once you start these filings. And so it's just very important to have a game plan in place. Next slide, please. So again, when you're talking about actually starting down this road for patents, and again, I've said, because these, these clocks, they just don't stop. So. Um, one thing that, especially as you're growing that first patent, um, that, that first suite of patents, that first deal, um, it, is, it is a great and momentous occasion, but as I learned very quickly a long time ago, a patent pending stamp does very little to actually, I should say, does nothing to facilitate what you wanna do. So the key is just to have a plan in place. Um, and with a small team, again, reach out to your counterparts in your region or sister schools. Um, that may be a more analogous to the, to the issues that you're doing. And the great thing about this grant is that you have so many opportunities to engage with smaller offices or offices that are just at that next step from you that can help you do those plans. But you need to have them written down. Um, like I said, even if it's just a flat Excel file back of the envelope, um, but be mindful of what these intellectual property deadlines are and what they mean to your budget, to your time, to your sanity, and to your partners. Um, when you're first engaging with industry, and again, whether it be large corp um, or small and mid cap companies or one person startups, um, just remember to never underestimate the expectations of the other partner. Um, it, you may think a, a license to a BASF or a Pfizer is just a handoff, but it's absolutely not. Um, as some of our speakers so, so beautifully mentioned, it's you know, you want to get the one page marketing document down, but they're going to want to see every bit of data that you've ever done. Um, especially when you're working with small companies, even small to mid cap companies, um, it, unless they have a internal team and an external board or external consultants that know everything, we have had conversations where the day after signature, they're, set, they're like, well now, what FDA consultant do you recommend we use? Um, so you don't underestimate those expectations in terms of everything that you're going to have to put into this. And so one thing that's critical for me, even as, as we grow our office, is, is the time versus return um, in the ROI is just critical because um, you want to match that with the culture of the university that we've talked about in the first two sessions and the expectations of what's going on. Um, Certainly you have aspirational goals in terms of where you want to go and, and I always recommend that you talk to the larger offices as much as you talk to the small ones because you need to have a plan in place. Um, but don't bite off every single element of what an, a full flown commercialization office looks like because what's going to happen and go to the next slide please. Um, or some of the things that, that Andy mentioned, you don't want to create um, unrealistic expectations within the culture of either your individual inventors or your administration, because that creates havoc, um, that black hole that, that Andy mentioned. So I kind of wanted to show you some of the things, again, that you think you've covered on the back of that envelope and you have in place, but you absolutely need to keep these things in mind when you are engaging with industry. Again, large or small, 
license or um, sponsored research, um, but you need to be mindful of some very key things that sometimes are perceived as beyond the grasp of the, or beyond the bounds of the actual technology itself. You think you're giving or, or you're partnering on an anti-cancer drug, um, but again, is it going to be an exclusive relationship with them? Are they going to get all fields of use or does the professor department chair or research group expect to, to retain certain fields of use. Um, this one's huge. Um, again, that extends to background IP and research. Do we need to draw clear lines about what's being partnered with, with your um, new collaborate, collaborator? Do we need to keep some things, um, or are there already pre-existing relationships with other organizations, even another university, that need to be kept separate from that? Um, so a lot of these are just lawyer language type things, but you need to be very careful about non-competes. Also, extremely caref careful with the use of your university's name. These are sometimes called publicity clauses. This is especially important with um, working with small to mid-cap companies who are in valuation cycles. You want to make sure that your contracts state that you get the right to see what they're using your name for, because if they're small, they they might be they would love to use your name. You just want to, and you want them to. You just want to make sure they're doing it in an appropriate way. My biggest thing is building in development milestones, um, especially in biomedical. Um, I think I've said this before. You know, I'll give up two points on a royalty rate to ensure that they've got that pre-IND meeting set within the first 12 to 18 months, depending on where the technology is. But development milestones to me are as important, if not more important than any upfront payments or anything like that. Because again, the goal for a university that's still growing and still trying to get its um, feet wet is to have a success story. And the only way you have control of that is if you've got your partner very clearly linked to, to what's going to go on um, and what's going to happen then. And that just in the, those, the, the remaining ones are, are what we've already talked about. But again, you need to really think about what your goals are. I mean, are you really looking for the next Lyrica, um, which you hope you are, but um, getting on base, those, those singles and doubles on, and those quick success stories are so important to your internal and external culture. Um, next slide. I think that's it. Is that it? These are just some lessons learned. I won't go through them all. Um, I know we've hit on these and our, our, our speakers have hit on them a lot, but um, one of the, the key points I think in, in my takeaway, especially hearing with the speakers, is again, um, that relationship building and again, having clear expectations. Uh, Follow-up is critical. Documentation is absolutely critical. Even, you know, you'll You'll get a lot of um, vendors out there who want to sell you very expensive databases. If you're not ready for that, that is absolutely fine, but keep an Excel file of every, you know, make sure you've got all your conversations. You never know where it can lead. Again, um, Mike's comment earlier about LinkedIn. To us, when LinkedIn started, it absolutely changed our life in terms of um, our ability to connect with friends and family and industry. Um, so, but just keep track of that. You never know when it comes full circle, especially in biomedical because executives will leave one company and go to the other. Uh, our, my licensee right now is with a spin out from a biotech company where four executives left that we worked with 10 years ago and now we're, we're, we're working with them again. So just always keep track of that. And that's all I have. Thank you, Allison. Um, next up, we have David Gulley, Puerto Rico Trust. Yes, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, sort of an island view of how we market early stage research discoveries and engage companies. Go ahead, Liz. So are we geographically challenged? Well, when you look at a geographic map, well, maybe we are. We're a very small island. We're heavily industrialized, though. Uh, if you look at the slide below, we have a very large pharma, biotech, and me medical device and ag bio manufacturing base. Uh, we're also very densely populated. Uh, we're about fourth, I think, in the US and just behind Massachusetts in terms of population density. Uh, and we're the size of Connecticut with about 3.2 million people. But you see all these companies around our island, they're manufacturing companies. That's how we engage with them, with technologies that might relate to manufacturing. It's more of a workforce uh, connection that we have with them and not necessarily a technology transfer um, connection. 
uh, that takes a little more work on our behalf. Liz? Next. Thanks. So what we did, uh, in 20, we launched in 2016, added another partner in 2017, two more in 2018, and now we're working with a whole group. So we wanted to align the marketing resources that reflected our particular portfolio to match the research strengths of our academic partners. So these are some of the platforms that we use. Some are more passive, but some are very active and very specific. Uh, for example, the BioVentures for Global Health is really focused um, on, on the, some of the work that we have a number of researchers working on uh, in tropical and neglected diseases. So that's very important for us based on our research base and based where we are. Uh, we also have WIPO Green, which is another platform that's a marketplace for green and sustainable innovations. And being where we are with sustainability, particularly disaster sustainability, is very important for us. So we use that when we have technologies that are related to those types of efforts. That's a global base uh, uh, sponsored actually by WIPO. Um, Autumn Innovation Marketplace is a very large uh, platform with 14,000 or more. That's passive. You, you know load them up and let them go. Zimbio uh, is a really um, a platform for us to again focus on research tools and reagents. Uh, we have a master licensing agreement with Zimbio which is based in the UK. That's to help our researchers in terms of being able to connect their particular unique research tools and reagents and have again those used and reused by a number of different um, research institutions around the world. And then in part, which is one of the center I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, uh, because that's more active. It's an engagement, it's an active platform for us. Uh, Liz? Next, yeah, there we go. So we use in part really, we see it as a global bridge for us. So in parts based in the UK, uh, but they have global reach. They're also a fairly new a marketing platform. I think about 250 universities currently use them. Those are mostly European and US universities. And they have about 5,500 R&D companies that also use it uh, as a way. But it's not passive because uh, in part for us, we pay for that. Um, but in part for us allows us to have also an industry liaison inside in part that works to target our particular technologies to companies that have listed those interest areas. So it's really actively reaching out to them. Uh, Liz, next one. And so here's an example, for example, here's an example that it, because it, it not only includes the technology license component, but also R&D collaborations. So there's an also connection there uh, where companies are looking for an R&D partnership or collaboration with expertise. We then uh, dive into our particular resource base to see what we have. It may be technologies or it may be researchers that are not disclosed again. So we use that uh, in a way to connect back for research and development collaborations. Liz? Uh, so here, here's an example of some output, uh, our last year of that. Um, so we have a number of uh, technologies that we uh, have on the IMPART site. It also connects to our site, so it can go directly into that. So we don't have to redo, if you will, for our own stuff. We had about 347, 345 direct contacts with key companies last year with our technologies. Now, our, our aim is not necessarily to license a technology or to get an R&D collaboration, but our aim is to really establish a relationship. That's what's important for us with Impart. And that's to get feedback and determine interest levels. So that actually works through the Impart platform. We want to set up a meeting with company business or scientific staff based on their particular interest, and we would do that at a first level. Then second level, we would probably we may share more information at that point, and then also to have a meeting between our inventors and the company scientific staff uh, when there's even to kind of take the deeper dive. So really, what we're we're there for is to identify the collaborations or licensing opportunities we have, and you can see a little global map, map there where all of this is tracked, and and you can see where most of the uh, companies that have shown interest in our technologies are located. Liz? So that's it. Um, that's the way we engage. We also, of course, take part in, in uh, partnering, uh, uh, partnering uh, uh, kinds of uh, events when we can. Uh, and we have other kinds of outreach, but I wanted to really focus on some of the platforms that we identified that are specialized uh, to match our particular research strengths. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Um, Ian's going to um, share his slides next. Uh, Ian, I think you're on mute. I was on mute, am I, and now I'm not. <laughs> okay, can you, you can hear me now, Liz? Yes, I can hear you, and you should have control now if you wanna give it another try. I do. Okay. Um, all right, so there's a number of these things have been talked about, but it's important to understand that the, uh, we're not looking for touch points with industry uh, just when we market our technology. Uh, and so um, there's a number of things that our office does to partner and, and we, we, we call them services, but basically we do technology matching. Um, we also um, uh, create relationships as David uh, pointed out for just uh, co uh, collaboration opportunities. Um, we're just as happy as if we can put a scientific team from, uh, from a company together in a, in a discussion, right? With our, with our faculty where brainstorming can happen. Uh, we can create value uh, that way. Um, we have we manage about 1,200 material transfer agreements or non-disclosure agreements for the entire university. It's important that our office does that, not because we love piles and piles of administrative work with contracts, uh, but because every one of those conversations is an additional touch point with a company. Um, uh, and a lot of these uh, long-term engagements start with something like a non-disclosure agreement or a material transfer agreement before intellectual property is even created. Um, and so we are uh, the start of those relationships. Uh, and ultimately, we hope 10 years later that that might culminate in a license. Um, uh, and then a lot of startup company development work. And so, you know, the, the services that we, that, we, uh, that we can offer through this business development, um, uh, we, are, we are a first stop concierge for matching um, research needs with top research talent at, at our university. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, we also like to think that we are very reasonable in the terms that we can provide if anyone is looking for actual access to both research or technology rights, intellectual property rights, uh, that we do so in a much, uh, in, in a very commercially reasonable manner. Um, so, uh, we, there, when we, when we actually look at marketing our technologies and looking at industry engagement that way, uh, we do it in two ways. Uh, it's already been described um, today as passive uh, and, and non-passive uh, non or passive and proactive. I like to call it the push and the pull. Uh, the pull for us is we have a technology portal. Uh, it's through a tool that we call Flintbox. Uh, or not, we don't call it, it's called Flintbox. A lot of universities utilize this tool, uh, but ultimately every unlicensed or available technology that we have for license, we create marketing uh, materials, a, a one page abstract, uh, in some cases, uh, some slides, um, and we put them into this portal. This portal is available from our website. Um, and our goal is to get uh, a certain number of indications of interest unsolicited through this portal every year. Um, and we've met that uh, every year that we've used this. Um, ultimately, we like to, uh, uh, I think this past year, we had 15 um, um, uh, actual engagements that were solidified um, uh, at, through this unsolicited uh, platform, this, this the pool method here. Um, outside of the pool though, we have the push. The push is the more proactive strategic approach. This is where we're actually doing diligence on the companies. We're approaching them because we know that they may have an interest uh, or, or we would like to think that they would if they really knew what we have. Um, this is where non-disclosure uh, agreements can come into play, uh, where we reach out to them. Uh, we give them the teaser, that's the marketing abstract. Um, uh, and then we um, might put their, our scientists with their scientists uh, and have a deeper dive. But this strategy is, um, we have a team of, um, of licensing people that are 100% uh, dedicated to uh, proactive marketing uh, and engaging in this push. Uh, but it's not sort of a spray and pray. Uh, to actually be, actually be effective at this method, uh, you have to do real diligence and research. You have to really understand who you're reaching out to, uh, what level within that company you're, you're reaching out to, and what your conversation is going to be uh, once you actually get them on a the phone. Um, however, just marketing your technologies, we've learned is not enough. One of the most um, 
uh, uh, the, one of the most value add things that we have done as an office is we developed a outside of our technology marketing efforts uh, and our commercialization and licensing team, we created a strategic alliances team. The strategic alliances team uh, takes a much more holistic approach to engagement with industry. And this is really just the relationship development part. Um, we have uh, Tanya Phillips in our office has been the leader of our strategic alliances um, uh, efforts. Uh, and frankly is is a perfect person for this type of a role uh, where she's inclined to be uh, to develop networks gets out into the community um, attends events sits on boards uh, and that kind of relationship development can be so important because when we look at creating things like ma a master agreement with a large company like lexmark that is right down the, from the road from us as a fortune 1000 company um, uh, this is that we're doing it through a strategic alliances approach for our office, not just a we'll touch base with you every time we think we have a technology you might like. Um, and that's proven really, really valuable. We also put marketing in this uh, in this role because marketing is has a, plays a really large part um, in, in how we can approach and create these holistic relationships uh, with these companies. Um, let's see. Uh, two quick things. My last two slides are really unique ways that maybe you have not thought about in ways that you can engage industry. One for us has been our Patent Palooza event. It's a celebratory event. We celebrate all of the innovations and, and commercialization successes at our university each year, but we invite industry and we invite investors and we invite the community partners, our uh, sort of economic development stakeholders in and around our region to this event. Uh, we've grown it by about 50, uh, 25 to 50% each year in attendance. And it's been a splash for us. This has been really, really neat because we bring people onto the campus. They actually get to meet and talk with our faculty uh, scientists at the event. Um, uh, and it's been a really, really, really um, unique way for us to, to capture engagement opportunities. Another is to do it through creating awareness. Um, we have uh, started a UK Women Innovators Network as an example. Uh, we have an annual symposium uh, and, uh, and, and periodic events uh, where we are sponsoring um, the, these events and it allows us uh, a platform to reach out to and engage um, sort of successful, uh, in this case, successful as an example, successful women leaders in entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and we have them join committees and sit on panels with us and things like that. Those kinds of things really create relationships that can, uh, that can develop into other things uh, that ultimately might be uh, partnerships, research collaboration and licenses. Uh, and that's all I think I have. Oh, so what, my last slide here, there was a question earlier from Bruce about um, the revenue distribution and whether it might be better if it goes to uh, the business instead of back into research. What we've actually put together here is a representation of various of the, uh, the, the, the royalty income distribution policies of a number of different institutions that you've heard from today. Uh, you can see here that in, in, in almost every case, inventors um, um, receive a share, uh, although you know, um, it differs by university. Uh, but not every university provides some back to um, the departments um, or the colleges uh, in some cases. Um, the University of Kentucky uh, does provide 20% to the college, 20% to the department, and then 20% to the UK Research Foundation. 40% goes to, uh, to our inventors. Um, uh, but I think one thing that I wanted to touch on to, to Bruce's point, yes, it's intuitive that it might make sense to give more money back to the business, but ultimately it's really, really important that we create an environment of incentive uh, that incentivizes continued activity in innovation and commercialization. If you don't provide, and that includes the department chairs and the deans of our colleges, because it's top down, right? Uh, those incentives have to be in place where the deans and the department chairs see a reason to uh, encourage this type of activity uh, and, and ultimately including them in the revenue distribution for us has played a huge role in, in helping to create that culture. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you um, all the speakers. That was super valuable information. Unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time for a discussion, um, but I think it was probably worth it to hear all of these inside um, and we did have the one question from Bruce, which I think um, Ian has addressed, but in the, the slide kind of shows you the range that, you know, the percentages that go to investors. Um, possibly we could, we probably should stop here um, because we're out of time. Unless anybody has a, a pressing question and, and can stay on, we're happy to answer maybe one more question. 
Um, but in, in, t in case one comes in, I'll just, I'll just wrap up by saying um, we appreciate everyone who has come to these sessions. We hope they've been valuable. Um, previously, I've sent out a link to the recordings and the slides, and we'll also add this recording and the slides. And in addition, Allison is working on a resource guide to help summarize some of the things we talked about, and I think that'll be very valuable. So we will put that on the share drive as well and make that available to everyone. So with that, I just uh, wanted to thank you again for coming and uh, hope it's been valuable. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.